This week on QTV Profiles, we have Noah Richler, a nationally acclaimed author, broadcaster, journalist, and we're here in Kingston for the Kingston's Writers' Fest. And so I'll start with my first question. Your first book, This Is My Country, What's Yours, found great success. It even won British Columbia's National Canadian Prize for Nonfiction. That's right, yeah. And why did you choose to use authors from across, across the nation in trying to uh, find Canada's identity? Well, I, I'd worked as a producer and presenter of radio programs for the BBC, which is like the CBC, but works out of London, England for a long time. And I tended to treat uh, political subjects. I go to places like Haiti or Angola or you know Sierra Leone, places that were in, in conflict. And I, I, you know, I was raised in a family with a novelist for a father, Mordecai Richler, whose work you probably know. And so before I went on a trip to, say, Angola, um, I would phone up the permanent BBC news correspondent there and I would say, what's the, what's the novel of Angola? What's the book of Angola that I should read? And what amazed me is that no matter how hardened and cynical the reporter who was stationed in the uh, whatever was the place I was going to, they always had an answer. They would say, oh, you've got to read Susa Jamba's Patriots, or if I was going to South Africa, you have to read um, uh, Bosman's, uh, Herman Charles Bosman's work, uh, Macapan's Caves, it's a wonderful collection of short stories. So when I came back to Canada about um, 12 years ago now, uh, I sort of wanted to use that idea myself for the country that I grew up in and loved. And so when several years later I found myself embarking on the writing of this book, it seemed very natural in what is actually a cultural portrait of Canada um, to seek out novels, novelists, storytellers from across the country and sort of throw the map of Canada as we know it over, you know, over the shoulder and instead speak to storytellers about what binds us. So that's really why I did that. And what drew you to certain authors? Not well, all of them were particularly known. No, you're right. There's, there was always going to be a sort of top tier of uh, novelists that I uh, absolutely had to speak to um, or felt it was, you know, there was no question that these were among our best and, and those would include people like um, Guy van der Haag and Alice Munro and Alistair MacLeod. David Adams Richards, who's at the festival in Kingston here, the Kingston Writers Festival this year. Um, and then there was this wonderful kind of middle bunch uh, of people that I, you know, I knew and liked and had an opportunity to champion a little bit. And then almost to complete the map, there were others that I came along en route. You know, I remember, for instance, uh, new voices don't have to be young voices. And it was Jan Martel, author of Life of Pi, who recommended to me a woman in her 90s called Marta Bloom, and unfortunately she's dead now, um, who'd written her first novel, uh, I think at age 90, and it was a wonderful story of uh, her family's having settled that part of uh, Saskatchewan from Ukraine. And um, that was very exciting. So I was able to you know, fill in, but then there becomes a point where you've just done enough and your mind moves on to other things. So I think, oh my God, I've got nobody from ABTB. I have to speak to Louis Emla and I would speak to that person or I have to speak to Wason Choi, but it was too late to include because, you know, writing is a journey and at a certain point you stop absorbing and you start producing. Interesting. And before we move on to talking about your newest book, um, I came across a beautiful article written in Walrus Magazine. All right. Thank you. <laughs> that um, it focused on your trip to the set of Barney's Version, which for our viewers who don't know, Barney's Version is a 2010 film, and it featured Paul Giamatti and Dustin Hoffman. And how did your visit and to the very sexy Scott Speedman, <laughs> who apparently has a long history of acting here. <laughs> and did your visit to the set offer a different perspective into your father's work? Um, it was a very odd experience. I mean, Barney's version was uh, my father Mordecai Richler's last novel, and possibly, I suppose, uh, our memories are short. We could say the most successful. Uh, certainly, you know, one of the funniest and filled with the plot, and much loved by uh, not just by Canadians but also by Italians. And um, uh, I won the Giller Prize some time back, and I decided that I would uh, drop in on the. Uh, set a few times and the producers of the film were very kind and allowed me to do that. And I, I did form a relationship with uh, Paul um, Giamatti, the lead actor, who like me is actually a little awkward, a little bumbling, a little unsure. And um, so slowly we got to be uh, pals and that provided a bit of a way in. And it was, it was interesting. It, it still no, doesn't feel entirely settled to me. There was a um, curious moment where we were up in the townships near the place that uh, my 
family lived in for a while on a beautiful lake in uh, Quebec, Lake Manfromagog. And um, it felt very strange, actually, to see actors uh, performing out and to know that my father, it really felt like the spirit of my father in his house was just around the corner. And I had to, at one point, just go off for a, a bit of a swim and, and a bit of a private think. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I, I was recently with uh, the Nobel Prize winning writer V.S. Nepal, and who, late in his life, he's in his 80s now, finds himself writing about his father. And the, the sort of um, the extraordinary thing you realize if you, when you lose a parent, is that, uh, or a loved one, I should say, is that the, um, the dialogue with that person doesn't stop because the person's dead. And, and it's a very, it's a curious thing because it, you, you're still talking to the person. And here in Naples, like, you know, it's one thing for me, uh, uh, my father died 10 years ago, but for Naples, his father died much younger than he is now and uh, um, a few decades ago. And it was, and we talked about that a bit and this idea that, you know, you have this ongoing conversation and it's a strange one because you have to speak for the other person in that conversation too. So that's a long way of saying that the experience doesn't feel over yet, you know. And uh, I'm very lucky too. I mean, Charles Foran wrote a very um, decent biography of my father. Um, won one prize, nominated for a few, up for another. And um, M.G. Vasanji, other authors have all presented opinions. And, you know, when people come forward and they'll tell me about my father in various periods of their lives, so I'm quite uh, fortunate in a way um, to learn things. Um, so, as I say, it's an ongoing conversation. <laughs> So I guess moving on to your brand new book, uh, it's called What We Talk About When We Talk About War. Right. Um, it focuses on Canada's gradual deterioration in its um, peacekeeping agenda. And what made you decide to address this controversial topic? Um, well, first I should say thank you for bringing it up because uh, you're at Queen's. So I, like a bad student, I'm actually late with my assignment. So my book was meant to be out uh, as we're speaking in September, but it's been delayed till January and that was my decision because I just want to put some finishing touches to it and get all the facts right. It's a book about how we, um, uh, and, and it's been exerted in Queen's Quarterly, which is nice, it, uh, it's a book about how we narrate ourselves into war, how we make it permissible to stay in a war, and how we make it permissible to leave a war, and how we sort of use story all the way through to get us in through and out of uh, a conflict. Um, so it, it's not really a judgment on the war in Afghanistan, though in a, I, I do pass certain kinds of uh, comments on it. Um, but I'm, I, I was very concerned with what I was hearing and what feels to me like the emptiness of a lot of phrases. I mean, you at Queen's are uh, not far from CFB Kingston, so there's a, more of a, a military presence than there, than there is in many parts of the country. But uh, I was actually disconcerted by the very bellicose talk of governments and by a, a small number of academics and journalists with quite extraordinary power who not only were sort of speaking in very kind of sports rara terms about the war about Canada as a warrior nation but were being incredibly mean and insulting uh, about uh, the aspirations behind the five decades of peacekeeping um, that Canada participated in up till about 2001 and I, uh, I found the language astonishing and actually quite hateful and I felt that nobody was speaking back to the critics of this idea who were painting peacekeeping as naive, uh, hippy-dippy ventures. These are all quotes, uh, f you know, um, foolish. If you believed in peacekeeping, you were, uh, as I say, just a, you know, completely naive and had no idea of the country's history. And there was an incredible manipulation of myth and story in our history behind this. And there's still this ongoing pressure to imagine Canada, in fact, as having been a great military nation all this time. This is not for a moment to denigrate the work that soldiers do, but I have the right to be disturbed when phrases like support our troops are used as a kind of blackmail to mean you're not allowed to talk about the um, just aspect of the war that we're in because that is seen to not support our troops. And if you look at um, the utterances of uh, men, who are men and women who are supposed to be our most preeminent military historians, to my mind, are not great ones. Um, like David Bergson or Barry Cooper or Jack Granitstein, most of all, uh, or if you follow the extraordinary comments of uh, reporters like Christy Blatchford and Rosie D'Amano, uh, to a lesser extent, Andrew Cohen, Roger Griffiths, it's very disturbing that nobody's talking back to the comments they're making. 
And there are other things that they do. Uh, there's a sexualization of the soldier. So if you read De Mano and Blatchford, there are astonishing comments about you know, these extraordinary, beautiful alpha ma males that just don't belong in a national discourse about war. Uh, and you, know, you have a nation that's applauding itself for, or seems to be applauding itself for things like the Highway of Heroes, but where the war really has touched almost nobody's lives. I'm not speaking, of course, of the 157 combat dead and their families or the 65,000 um, soldiers and 25,000 reservists. But even if, if you assume that every one of those um, 90,000 um, knows two people, so th um, those two people are sort of one person away from the, from the war, then uh, if you do the calculations, it's sort of you know, less than half of 1% uh, of, of people in Canada can claim to be touched by the war, a war that's being compared to the First and Second World Wars when uh, there were 1.1 million uh, people served in, in um, the Second World War, and about 12% of the country could claim to be one, percent, one person away from it. That's a very, perhaps, too elaborate an explanation, but it, um, nevertheless, I found myself looking around you know, at restaurants that I was in and thinking, this isn't a nation at war, and yet it's applauding itself for being so. Um, and I was also extremely disturbed by the way, as I say, we talked ourselves into through and out of it. So at the beginning, um, you know, we were told we were going to war not to build schools for girls. This was very explicit. We're not going there to build for schools for girls, and if you think we're doing that, you're out of your mind. We're going there for security and to maintain our trade relationship with the United States. Then, around 2006, after five years of the war, um, and many casualties, uh, suddenly building schools for girls became what the government calls a signature project. And that's what we were doing. And even the people who were told us we were stupid for thinking it were suddenly painting uh, sort of slightly schlocky uh, scenes of what Canadian soldiers were doing and how they were helping uh, build schools for girls. And then when it became incumbent upon Canada to leave, talk of schools for girls sort of dropped. And so it's just tracking those inconsistencies and, and I'm hoping that those who do read my book when it comes out in January uh, will at least think twice about how they use words like hero or making a difference or dying in vain you know so because uh, I care about uh, language but more so I care about Canada and um, uh, I believe there are very real reasons why we were for a long time uh, a peacekeeping nation peacekeeping itself may be a, an altered sort of mission but this has always been a country that um, has served in, you know, in the cause of some greater uh, and more selfless idea, usually called democracy or whatever, whether it's fighting for the empire or the commonwealth or um, for NATO. You know, we don't uh, go to war to grab more territory or to kill people. That's not what we do. And I'd say that's still true today. It's an interesting perspective. Start, certainly start a conversation. I hope so, yeah. You know, I, had, I was very pleased because this was a, a nice uh, uh, start uh, in terms of a place to talk about it. And uh, there was a young officer at RMC, the Royal Military College, who came out. And I thanked him for coming out. And, you know, I feel it's very important when you write that you have to be able to say anything that you write to the person that you may be uh, criticizing or writing about. Um, that's always the best sign of writing in good conscience. If I'm writing a book review and I'm not able to say the things that I say about a book to its author, or if I'm writing about the army and not able to face a soldier, then, um, you know, uh, I'm in trouble. So um, uh, I addressed him and I pointed out that, it, um, and we had a nice conversation in the room. So that was, that was uh, very rewarding. And how can this generation of young Canadians help address and redefine Canada's role in peacekeeping? Well, uh, I mean, the, the, the word is problematic because it's been used by critics on the right. You know, they have pat phrases like, you know, uh, peacekeeping is a job that a soldier does, or how can you do that when there is no peace to keep? Um, these are riddles, really. I mean, in Afghanistan, we were told for the first five years it wasn't a war, it was an insurgency. And we're told, and this is another way in which language is interesting, we're told it's not a war because calling it a war meant basically that we had to treat prisoners of war that we now call detainees differently and accord them certain rights. So, um, and to you know, some of these people, I would say, well, why is it we're sending soldiers in a, into a place where there is no war to fight? 
uh, and how the war, and, you know, it's interesting that the war was then later called uh, a mission. And that's interesting to me too, because a mission is, um, you know, if you fight a war, you have to win it or lose it. Uh, if you fight a mission, you don't need that sort of judgment. And so even a word like that enables Canada after 10 years to leave, you know, without having really affected the fortunes of Afghans uh, a great deal. But um, the, your question is a, a good one because uh, for me, it's more a question of how can institutions in Canada accommodate the tremendous uh, goodwill and energy of youth. You know, um, you will have friends who are now, I imagine, working or planning to work with NGOs uh, in all sorts of organizations. Um, I believe that a good many of our soldiers join because they want to genuinely make a difference. If you look at the obituaries of soldiers, a sad way to learn it, you'll, you know, uh, the officer, Andrew Nuttall, died at the end of um, uh, 2009, and his, you know, the notice in the papers called for giving money to uh, charities, in, you know, in Africa. Others have done so for Afghanistan, uh, in order to help and to make a difference. And I, I think there are probably ways in which, as I say, the institutions, above all, the army, can change to um, make it more possible for people of all kinds, but predominantly young people to make the sort of contribution they want in line with their view of how we should live our lives. Because the bottom line about being Canadian is that we're exceptionally fortunate, not because we're better people, but just because we are. But the, the good side of our character is that we want to share that good fortune. We don't want to hoard it. Um, and I, I really believe that most Canadians go out in the world thinking, how can we make other people's lives better, i.e. more like our own, and not more like our own dogmatically, but more like our own because we want to share in this uh, exceptional um, uh, circumstances that we know. It's interesting. And um, for our viewers, if when his book comes out, I think every Canadian should take a look into it. It's called What We Talk About When We Talk About War. And Noah Richler, thank you very much. Thank you, Sabrina. Pleasure.